And then I think uh, it's time now to pass over to our next speaker, who is Natalia Ares from the University of Oxford. So if you're ready, Natalia, I'll uh, hand over to you. Hello. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. There we go. Is it uh, working now? Good. So, well, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity uh, to talk. And um, I'm gonna talk about machine learning machine learning to efficiently characterize and tune quantum devices. Uh, but first I want to highlight the contribution of my colleagues and, and collaborators here. Um, so we are in a race to produce a technologically relevant number of, of quantum devices. And in this race there are superconducting qubits and there are ion traps and there are semiconductor uh, qubits and um, we have, there are very good strategies to scale those up um, and, and they are based on the success of conventional uh, integrated circuits to which uh, Lisa gave a, a great introduction. Um, so, but a bottleneck to their scalability uh, is in device variability. And this is because um, these devices are slightly different. There are slight differences in fabrication and in the materials and therefore uh, we have to uh, tune them and characterize them and because we need millions of these devices uh, this task is uh, clearly needs uh, automation and smart automation because these differences are, 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 are really not something we can predict. So um, there have been um, very exciting work the last few years in using machine learning uh, to tune uh, devices and that's what, uh, what I want to focus on today on how to use machine learning algorithms for, measure, for measuring and tuning devices. So I'm going to focus on uh, laterally defined uh, quantum dots. These devices encode qubits in a single or, or, or in two electrons. And uh, these uh, electrons are controlled by bias and gate voltages. And uh, we can measure a current that flows uh, through this device. So you can think of this circuit uh, when, when I talk about the devices. And here you can see uh, micrographs of these devices showing a single or a double uh, quantum dot and this can get um, uh, very very complex complex uh, structures. So um, and here what you can see are measurements of current in these devices as a function of bias and gate voltages and uh, one of the uh, problems we have addressed is that these um, measurements take time and they are necessary to characterize um, the system. So how can we speed them up and I'm going to show you how we did that using machine learning. So uh, the technique we use, uh, one of the techniques we use um, is uh, our deep generative models. And although uh, you might not be familiar with those, uh, this is something we know very well because this is something we do all the time. So uh, we can you know, close our eyes and imagine a cat and we would come up with something that looks very realistic, but it might not be a real cat. And that's because we've been observing cats for a long time now. Um, well, the same can do this algorithm. So here you can see a uh, deep genetic model coming up with um, faces, human faces. And these are not real people, but they look very realistic. And uh, they also look like celebrities because the algorithm was trained on celebrity faces. Um, so how does uh, this um, can help for quantum device measurement? Well, something we can do is to take a very uh, low resolution measurement, in this case of current as a function of bias and gate voltages, and then we can ask a deep generative uh, model to come up with, uh, with, let's say, reconstructions of how this data might look like. So here you can see a couple of examples. So this is already very powerful because it tells us uh, already quite a lot about uh, the measurement of that, that we did in, 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 very, um, in a very short time. So this is already quite good, but we might want to go one step further and say, well, actually uh, this reconstruction has a, a closing diamond here, but an open one there. 
So I want to maybe distinguish these two cases. So how would I uh, do this? Well, something we can do is to, uh, in a partial measurement, if there is a, a, a trace that we want to know about, then uh, what we can do is take the, the traces from all the different reconstructions and compare them. So here what you can see are the, all the different uh, predictions uh, given by the model. And I have highlighted one in yellow and one in blue that are very different. Just to show you something, that it's that if you have one more measurement, you better do it in X1 and not in X2. Because in X2, all the, um, all the predictions coincide, so it's not very informative to measure there. And in that way, we could create an information game map where it's more informative to measure next. So, uh, and this we can do in the entire, uh, in the entire parameter space. So uh, we have built an algorithm that what it does is to take a very low resolution uh, measurement and then uh, it makes reconstructions uh, of how this data might look like and compares them all and sees where do they differ the most. And there is where it takes the next measurement in real time. And with this information, then it updates the next reconstructions and it continues this cycle. So here what I'm going to show you is these measurements running uh, on a real device. So here is the low resolution measurements that are just the pixels are brought apart so that um, we can feel things, uh, we can feel other measurements in between. And the information gain map or acquisition map, uh, which tells us how informative it is to measure in the different uh, points, pixels. So you can see there are black points that show that there is not much information in measuring measuring where we already did. Um, so you can see that the algorithm now uh, tends to uh, measure in places where the current changes and this is an immersion behavior. You can see you wouldn't do this um, to speed up but I, I'm just showing you how it finishes the measurement by, by filling the diamonds. This is because inside the diamonds the current is zero and it's flat so there is not much information there and that's why it does it um, as a last, um, as the last steps. And because, uh, well, this algorithm allows us to uh, reduce measurement times uh, significantly. And because uh, this algorithm is so broad and it, 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 it can be useful for any type of measurements and simulations if there is a, uh, an available training set. So I encourage you to, um, to um, explore uh, this algorithm uh, that it's in GitHub. And uh, let me talk about a different problem that uh, we address, which has to do uh, with device tuning. And what do I mean by, by a tuning problem? Well, uh, here you can see the current as a function of two gate voltages. And what you can see here is that actually the place where the device is operational, where we have single electron uh, transport, uh, it's quite small. It's just in this area here. And you can have single or double quantum loads uh, defined. But um, here I'm just, I'm just showing um, a cut of the real gate voltage space. If, if we were to plot a, the three-dimensional, a three-dimensional version of it, uh, you could see that now it's, it's like a surface that separates areas of high current and, and areas of no current. And the features we are looking for uh, where the device is operational would be lying somewhere uh, close near the super surface or this surface. Um, so as the number of gate voltages uh, grow, the dimensionality of this problem grows. And just to give you an idea how this scales, if we have uh, one qubit, um, let's say we have four gate electrodes and um, these have a range of around, let's say, four volts. And the single electron transport features that, uh, we are, that we are looking for are in the order of millivolts. That separates the space in four times to the 12 points. And if you're able to explore certain points a second, that takes you to something like 107, 127 years, which is, you know, just, uh, that's not the way we do it, but it gives you an idea of how big uh, the space is and um, where you are actually uh, searching. So um, we've been thinking on, on techniques uh, to, um, to, solve, to address this problem, to be able to tune these devices completely automatically without human input. And we realized that this problem 
it's uh, quite similar to the multi-armed bandit problem. So what is this problem? Well, you can imagine a, a gambler and a row of, um, of uh, slot machines, right? So the objective of the gambler is to maximize the reward. And the question that the gambler asks himself is, uh, well, which machine shall I play next? Um, I know the current success rate of, uh, of a few of the machines. Um, I could go to the one that has, for example, 70% current success rate, or I, I could try and explore what is uh, the success rate of uh, another machine that I don't know. So this is a problem known by the uh, known as uh, exploration versus exploitation trade-off. And uh, how does it map into our uh, tuning problem? Uh, so here you can see, uh, this is uh, an IPA, the IPA surface that separates, it's, it's a model of an IPA surface that separates high uh, current from low current regions. And uh, what you, the points that you see, and I'm gonna stop this, uh, yeah. The, the points that you see are observations we made, so measurements we make in the device. And um, the different colors that you can see are the prior belief that we would find um, the transport features in, in some close, in some regions close to that uh, IPA surface. So, uh, so we, what uh, we have done is an algorithm that actually searches this IPA surface efficiently to find completely automatically the operational um, points in this gate voltage space of, of a device. So let me show you how the algorithm uh, works uh, in general. So uh, in the beginning, so here you can see there is um, a region of current and a region of no current. And in the beginning, the algorithm doesn't know this. So it starts by um, taking a trace of current as a function of uh, gate voltage and in some given direction. And when it sees that the current drops a significant amount, then uh, it stops there because it knows, okay, now I have, I, I know I found my per surface. And then it does a uh, um, measurement of current near the IPA surface and two things can happen. It can happen that the point doesn't seem to be very promising because there are no transport features at all. Or it might be that you see nice uh, Coulomb peaks that indicate single electron transport. And in which case then it's a promising area. So we can then create a model that tells us, uh, well, that a model of where this IPA surface might be and uh, the different points uh, at which we could find transport features and uh, which are the yellow points here and the points where we couldn't find transport features which are the uh, green points there. So now we have, a, we have an idea, we have a model. So uh, what we do now is, and, and here comes the exploitation exploration versus exploitation trade-off is to choose the next point to explore. So we, we chose a next point to explore based on the prior belief of the probability of finding uh, transport features. So we do that and then we explore further by taking a, a, a two-dimensional plot there. And what we are looking for in particular, for example, in double dots are islands of current, which is what you can see there. And if you see them, it means you have succeeded in tuning your device. So uh, here it's um, a run of our algorithm for eight gate voltages. So now you can imagine that we are in an eight dimensional parameter space. And you can see that it does different uh, 2D plots and uh, eventually finds, as you can see uh, here, uh, the islands of, uh, of current that are particular to uh, double quantum dots. And this is what we are looking for. So for more details, please uh, look at, uh, at the paper. Uh, we've managed to do this completely automatically in 70 minutes, which we, we believe it's great. So something else that this algorithm lets us do is because now we have a model of the IPA surface, something uh, and, and some measurements uh, that about of this IPA surface, um, something we, we this algorithm uh, let us do is to um, compare the IPA surfaces of different devices and in this way quantify uh, device variability. So uh, you can see this uh, here, 
uh, the EPA, this is the real upper surface of a device and how it might compare with the, EPA, the real upper surface of a different device. And this is just restricted in three dimensions just for illustration. But here I can show you the, um, sorry, the uh, matrices that map one input surface into the other for different devices and for a single device in a thermal cycle. As you can see, the device variability between devices uh, was quite big in our case, but for the thermal cycle of a device, actually what we are seeing is that the upper surface just suffers uh, scaling. So this really gives us um, qualitative uh, and quantitative um, insights into the variability of devices. And now let me quickly show you um, a just a fine tuning algorithm, which means that once we are in these small um, islands of current, we just we need to get them uh, right in order to be able to operate the device as a qubit. Uh, so this is how the textbook triangles that you should see, and this is how actually uh, typically they look like. And then you spend a lot of your time changing the other gate voltages and the different knobs so that uh, these actually become two noise uh, vice triangles. So uh, we created an algorithm that does that automatically, and I won't have a lot more time to tell you how exactly we did it, but uh, you can search for details in the, in the archive. Um, and I hope with this I, I, I've showed you that actually there is a lot of um, potential and uh, had that these algorithms, these machine learning techniques uh, can uh, really uh, help us uh, scale uh, quantum devices. So in summary, I showed you efficient quantum device measurements and tuning using machine learnings, uh, using machine learning and uh, perspectives. Well, we want to optimize qubit operation in the same way, and we want to tune larger and larger uh, quantum circuits. So thank you very much. Thank you. That, that was a really great talk. Um, so I'm clapping not only for myself, but also on behalf of the over 175 people who are tuned into our session today. So that's really cool. Oh, well, um, thank you. We've, uh, we've got some questions over on Slido. So uh, the first one I'm going to ask is from Brian Flynn. And he asks, uh, does this use transfer learning or train a deep network from scratch? How long does the training take? Oh, so, um, uh, well, the, we, I, I showed different, uh, so for the... Uh, I think this was asked sort of towards the early, early part of the talk. Ah, yes. During, yes. So, yeah. so we, we, we do train a neural network from scratch and it takes uh, around an hour. Um, but once you train it, it's, it's done for different devices. So we, we did train it in uh, simulations mostly. So. And, and then some very small set of real data, uh, just to capture some of the features that real data has that simulations don't. Uh, and we train it once, and then uh, it, it, the algorithm works fine for different devices. And we, we, we have verified this. Cool, yeah, yeah, great. Um, so there's a question from Zixing Huang who says, um, how computationally intensive is the training algorithm, i.e. how fast is the optimization compared to the measurement acquisition time? Uh, so, so this is in the case of the measurement as well, I guess. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so uh, it is, comp well, it, it, it just uses a, a GPU and um, we, uh, we, we are limited by our measurement time and not by our computational time. Now, this is a, a very interesting point because if you were to measure, for example, as, as, as Lisa was pointing out with, um, with uh, radio frequency um, techniques, for example, uh, then your compute, in order to gain time, your computation has to be a lot faster. Uh, but there, is, there are ways to do this with, um, by uh, very simple with GPU, let's say very simply, simply with GPUs. So we, we didn't really optimize the computational time just because we were, our bottleneck was the measurement time. Uh, but of course there are techniques for fast readout and then, and then you do have to optimize the computational time in this case. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, I'm going to ask another question which comes from, Mario Castaneda, which, who says, um, could you comment on the robustness of this algorithm against noise in the measurement? And I guess that question could apply to both algorithms. 
Yes. So, um, well, for um, I, I can tell you um, for for the measurement algorithm. Well, the there is uh, different uh, noise patterns, but let's say all of these are, are in some sense learned during training, uh, if, if they are representative type of uh, noise. Uh, for the tuning algorithm, uh, that's a bit more of a, um, th that more important because there, uh, for example, we don't, we don't have a, a training set. Uh, what we do is actually uh, gain information from these uh, current traces. So maybe I can come back. Uh, to this up here. So if there is noise such that um, here, for example, if there is noise in such a way that uh, you think there is a peak when there is no peak, uh, then uh, your algorithm would be confused. Uh, so on that you have to uh, probably be smarter at detecting the features uh, if the device is, is, is very noisy or very switchy. So we are we are actually investigating ways. These de these devices uh, that we try the algorithm on, uh, thanks to our, our collaborators in Basel, they are they are super um, super um, super good devices, and they they, they are not very uh, noisy. Uh, but uh, but but it would be nice to uh, actually um, check how robust they are in very switchy devices as well. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so uh, another question. We've had lots of questions on uh, the Slido Q&A, so I'll ask another one. Um, we've got maybe time for this last one. So um, yeah. can you maybe comment a little bit about how you choose the initial conditions of your, before you train the models? The um, initial conditions you use in these uh, algorithms? So, um, so for, for, these, uh, for this tuning algorithm, uh, the only initial initialization, let's say, that the, that the algorithm needs is the, uh, at uh, one extreme of the gate voltage space and the other extreme of the gate voltage space. Um, once you have uh, that uh, measure, it's at this um, region, and uh, there are different uh, values of current. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Sorry, um, oh. it's, it's cutting out a little bit for me. Um, no. if, if it's okay, I think maybe uh, we, we can take this conversation over to the, the Slack. Um, yeah, well, yeah. I'm sure people have more questions as well. Um, but yeah, I wanna thank you again. That was a, a really nice talk.